It is perhaps better that you die in the innards of a worm. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 reasons why Dune 1984 is hated. No one ever dreamed there were so many. Squeeze, as I promised. I want you to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. We'll salvage what we can, but I can tell you, dear God. For this list, we're looking at why many fans loathe the 1984 film adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune. Do you like the 1984 version of Dune? Let us know in the comments below. Number 10. The Lack of Fidelity to the Source Material David Lynch is arguably one of the most creative and unique filmmakers to ever pick up a camera. His body of work speaks for itself, but a massive fan of Dune he was not. His lack of interest in the source material, and arguably blockbuster sci-fi in general, shows through in the adaptation. I did not say this. I am not here. I understand. For starters, he aged the main character, Paul Atreides, making our protagonist's journey a fundamentally different one for him not being a teenager. I know, Thufar, I'm sitting with my back to the door. I heard you, Dr. Yui, and Gurney coming down the hall. Other characters are introduced only to have their storylines unceremoniously abandoned. Certain creative choices, which will be discussed in greater detail later in the video, actually go against the fundamental message of Herbert's novel. Don't try your powers on me. Try looking into that place where you dare not look. You will find me there staring back at you. Number 9. It tries to condense way too much material. Denis Villeneuve's updated adaptation of Dune will only cover the first half of the novel. The future. I can see it. While this might seem like a marketing ploy to set up the sequel, it is for the best. Dune, like The Lord of the Rings, simply can't be condensed into a single film, at least not in a satisfying way. You shall not pass! We learned this the hard way watching the 1984 attempt. The universe of Dune is so complex and nuanced that the film has no choice but to give these massive exposition dumps. They're off-putting and actually make the whole thing somehow feel less accessible. In an attempt to meet a reasonable runtime, huge chunks of this sprawling narrative were left on the cutting room floor. The resulting story feels disjointed and half-baked. Damn sloppy. Really damn sloppy. Number 8. The Internal Monologues Spice. Pure, unrefined spice. Despite the source material's density, Universal Pictures demanded a film with a standard running time. Producers Raffaella De Laurentiis and her father Dino De Laurentiis stepped in to deliver. In order to cut the film down, seams were trimmed or excised, and the blanks were filled in with voiceovers. Father, I promise one day the sleeper will awaken, and I will avenge your death. I will not stop until I destroy the Emperor and the Baron. There is a time and a place to use narration as a window into the mind of a character. This is a crash course in how not to do it. Characters serve as mouthpieces for exposition dumps, but more often than not, the results are entirely unhelpful. House Atreides took control of Arrakis 63 standard days into the year 10,191. It was known that the Harkonnens, the former rulers of Arrakis, would leave many suicide troops behind. These internal monologues are delivered in a creepy whisper that's jarring and distracts from the scene. Jessica had successfully transmuted the poisonous water of life. Every man who has tried has died. Most damning? It can be unclear whose thoughts we're hearing. Number 7. It Lacks Action if this was intended as producer Dino De Laurentiis' answer to Star Wars, he really missed the mark. Hey! No! Enough! Our beloved galaxy far, far away boasts incredible world-building and unique characters, but it's also thrilling. The Star Wars films succeed largely by making the audience feel like they're part of a grand adventure. Remember, the Force will be with you. The 1984 version of Dune, by contrast, feels like an advanced poli sci course for an alien civilization, taught by someone in their second or third language. It is by the juice of Safu that thoughts acquire speed, the lips acquire stains, the stains become a warning. It is by will alone I set my mind in motion. For a film that tries to cram in way too much, there's remarkably little in the way of action. 
When something exciting does happen, the scene is usually short, poorly choreographed, and lacking in relatable stakes. It's what have killed me. Number 6. The Many, Many Cheesy Moments If you're planning on revisiting this film anytime soon, skip the popcorn and break open a bag of nachos instead. Because this film has got cheese to spare. I would not have permitted you to harm my tribe. From my dreams. So beautiful. When working within the sci-fi genre, there's a fine line between self-seriousness and parody. I want you to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze! Give me spice! Sadly, more often than not, the combination of overacting and absurdly pretentious dialogue tips the scales in favor of the latter. When reading Dune, there's a real gravitas to the characters and events. The film reduces most of the book's most powerful players to their eccentricities. Get out of my mind! Until you tell them both who I really am. Add the flamboyant costuming, questionable wording throughout, and what we can only assume was a mandate to crank the intensity to 11 at every opportunity, and you get a film that feels like an SNL sketch. I see it. I can see it. You see the one. Number 5. The Hair, Makeup, and Costumes there are some people out there who consider the aforementioned design choices to be the only thing that David Lynch got right with this adaptation. There's no denying that the filmmaker tried to create a richly themed and immersive world with unique visuals. But for all the bold decisions that were made, the end result is still underwhelming. My Duke, how I failed you. This thoroughly mid-80s idea of how a futuristic society would look felt almost immediately dated. For every character design that was appropriately weird, there were two others that felt cartoonishly over the top and deeply uncool. Sting in that codpiece is seared into our eyes forever. Then there were group outfits that seemed like complete afterthoughts. The Harkonnen and Atreides uniforms feel like leftover costumes from other films. I remember the first step in avoiding a trap is knowing of its existence. I know. Number 4. Weirding Became Guns we get that weirding is somewhat vaguely defined in the books, but surely there were more elegant ways to portray it on screen. Precise control. Heck, we would have settled for anything that didn't directly contradict Herbert's world. One of the more interesting pieces of world building in Dune is that personal shields have rendered projectile weapons largely obsolete. As such, hand to hand combat and blade weapons are the norm. <laughs> The weirding way is an advanced style of movement that allows for incredibly effective combat. But Lynch reportedly said that he didn't want to see, quote, kung fu on sand dunes. So in the film, it becomes a gun. That's right, instead of something resembling martial arts, we got the weirding module, which can only be described as a poorly designed laser gun. This is part of the weirding way that we will teach you. Number 3. The Rain As refreshing as it might have looked on paper, in practice, the climactic rainfall on Arrakis stung badly. At the heart of the original novel is the idea that Paul Atreides is being made into a god by those who see him as the messiah. Muad'Dib had become the hand of God, fulfilling the Fremen prophecy. Where there was war, Muad'Dib would now bring peace. While he does possess powers of precognition, his status as a deity isn't supported by actual miracles, but rather through the fervent belief of others. This worries him immensely, as he's afraid of unleashing a bloody holy war. Having him make it rain really misses the point. And how can this be? It's also not clear how he does it. Just powers, we guess? Doesn't this make the secret Fremen water stores redundant? Plus, all that moisture would destroy the sandworms and spice, bringing down galactic civilization. Number 2. It lacks a clear message Building on our previous entry, it's important to understand what Frank Herbert's Dune means to people. Yes, it's a decadently dense universe with a rich mythology, but it's equally elaborate in its use of allegory. Arrakis. Dune. Desert planet. Moving. Moving. The 
1984 film adaptation is a bold and ambitious attempt to recreate the world of Dune on the big screen, but it takes the style and leaves behind the substance. Because the film makes Paul into a super-powered messiah, the story is reduced to another run-of-the-mill tale about a chosen one. Father! The sleeper has awakened! It doesn't really offer commentary on what that narrative means. We Fremen have a saying. God created Arrakis to train the faithful. One cannot go against the word of God. By making Paul a literal god, the 1984 film adaptation robs Dune of its greatest insight and offers nothing to say in its place. Before we unveil our top pick, here are some honorable mentions. David Lynch wasn't given creative freedom. The director famously disowned the film because of studio intervention. But when you don't have final cut, total creative freedom, you stand to die the death. Die the death. And died I did. The treatment of female characters. Rather than being powerful and feared as in the books, they seem to live to serve men. Hurry. All I see is darkness. Paul. I will love you forever. Duncan Idaho's inglorious end. Beloved characters should get more screen time and a worthy death. Why haven't we heard from you? My lord, I suspect so much. Key characters look silly and are underdeveloped. Pompous speeches from emotionally detached characters with unclear motivations. I'm alive, eh? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Massive Plot Holes When you're aiming for world building on a scale this large and fail, your plot holes exist on a comparable scale. Even with a runtime of 136 minutes, or 186 for the TV version, the film has to skip over key details, backstory, and explanations. Thanks to your teachings, it's changing my consciousness. And these aren't just missing subplots that'll frustrate fans of the book. We're talking about glaring plot holes that break the reality of the film. Where, pray tell, does Paul Atreides get all those weirding modules with which he arms the Fremen? Wadib. Weren't they destroyed in the earlier attack? Weirding modules destroyed. This is arguably the biggest and most glaring plot hole in the film. But it's not the only one, and the narration is often just a crude band-aid trying to cover them up. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.